just excited about the start of spring practice, excited to see our guys rather than running around cones, actually running routes, covering people. There, there won't be a whole lot of uh, you know, physicality, obviously, in, in the first two practices. The NCAA mandates that we have to be in shorts and helmets. I'm not sure why, but they do. I think Coach Brown once famously said, you don't tell divers to go practice diving the first two times without any water in the pool. So I'm not, still not sure why we, we don't allow them to put their safety equipment on. Uh, so the first two practices won't tell us much other than uh, the two things that I think are really important. And had a meeting with our coaches, in fact, this morning, and I said, uh, the two things that we demand in this program, that we don't coach, we don't teach, that we demand our effort and ball security. And so everything else, don't worry about anything else. We'll fix it. Guy runs the wrong route, goes the wrong way, does the wrong technique. We can fix that. If a guy doesn't go hard, that's, that's hard to fix. Uh, so we want to see guys that go really hard, defense running and flying to the football. And then on offense, if you touch the football, you better protect it with everything you got because uh, it's the, the difference in winning and losing football games. So with that, uh, again, really excited to be starting, and uh, we'll know a lot more about this team, though, once we put pads on after spring break, but at least excited to see the guys running around. Questions? Questions? Start right over here on the right. Dennis? Coach, you hit, I mean, the, the two things that are obviously very important to you in effort and, and uh, ball security. Is there another, like, Priority list. It's like I want to come out of the spring with like a little check. Mm. Not really, other than maybe establishing the way that we practice and why it's so critical to success and why you have to go so hard in practice in order to, to win games. That is, is critical. Um, from a specific standpoint, I, I think we got to find some D linemen. I'm, I'm worried about that group through the the winter off season. Uh, didn't perform very well, and not sure about the, the types of bodies that we have there as well. And, and got to find some length. And then, uh, I mean, we got to figure out if if our running backs will run over somebody, because um, that's really important in that position is to, to play with some physicality. So just off the top of my head, I would say those are two things that I'm going to be looking at very, very closely. Hey, Tom, how much in a first spring with your new team is it about just seeing what these guys are like on the field as opposed to working out compared to maybe next year or the year after when you kind of know that? Yeah, I, I think there's two things that go into that, not just finding out, but also teaching them. What's, what the expectation is here, too. You're going to find out a, a, a lot about a guy the first play you, you see him and about what's in there intrinsically, you know, and, and what comes naturally to him. But uh, it's also our job to teach them what is necessary in order to, to win championships. And so uh, there would be a lot of evaluating, a lot. And I would tell you, I know we get – Really excited about depth charts around here, from what I've heard. Um, the, the, the depth chart after the spring is, is not going to be um, miraculous. Although the spring, spring is where you start turning some heads and you start earning a starting job. Because really, at the end, uh, you know, in training camp, it's about going to win a game and getting prepared for the season. Um, there's not a whole lot of time in training camp for evaluation. Tom, can you? Uh, are there any position? You got a haircut. Yeah, thanks. looks good, man. Appreciate you. Yeah. Um, any position changes that you know going into spring, especially at tight end where you're you're thin, and your thoughts on who would be an inside or outside linebacker? Uh, Garrett Gray. We we moved him a while back to tight end. I should have told you. But hopefully, it's pro he's probably a year away just from a mass standpoint uh, to being big enough at that position. Other than that, I don't think we have any position changes. Um, outside linebacker right now 
you know, we, we play so much nickel, especially in this conference. So the, the field outside linebacker in, in our defense is substituted for a nickel. So uh, right now, that, that'd be a guy like P.J. Locke or a guy like John Bonney, maybe a, a, a guy that's got some, some size and some physicality. Uh, and then to the boundary, you know, Nashawn Hughes is, is probably a guy that'll, that'll start uh, at outside linebacker. Um, you know, and then we just got to see the, the body types. He's the one that off the top of my head I know will be there, but we're going to play the best three linebackers uh, wherever that, that is. And whether that's, uh, you know, a guy that we thought might have been an outside guy that we're playing inside, so be it. Um, but we're, we're going to play the best three. Uh, Coach, obviously you, you just talked about the defensive line. There are numbers there, so is this more of the conversation around body type and losing weight and length and height? And Are you trying to work to it, or do you just not have the effort there? Yes. Uh, um, all of the above. The, the, the effort as a group has not been to our requirements here in this program. I think the the body types again. I think I think we'd know a lot more if if some of these really fat guys lost some weight. You know, on what's actual. You know, what does their body really look like? You know, right now I don't know because we got some guys that are 360, 350 pounds. I don't know how you move at at that weight. Um, so we're we're working on it. I'm, I'm we're certainly not going to throw our hands up and say woe is me. The, the last time I checked, you got to play play with a defensive line, you know, the cool thing about tight end is you can figure out formations where you don't need one. In the game of football, you got to play with a defensive line. <laughs> and uh, so we're, we got to teach them. And that's, I've told Coach Giles and Coach Orlando that too, that uh, they're what we got. There's no waiver wire in college football. We can't go sign a couple free agents, this, that, and the other. They're, they are who we got, and we need to make players out of them. Coach, uh, you may be asked about the quarterback situation once or twice, and when you're doing your assessments and you start looking at these guys, what is a Tom Herman quarterback look like uh, And so we can know what to look for in spring? Competitive, leader, football smart. Uh, I've seen a lot of guys that are average students that are brilliant on the football field. Uh, so not necessarily, you don't have to be a 4.0 GPA to be football smart. Um, I think you've got to be a guy that your teammates gravitate towards, that you make better. You make your teammates around you better through your play and your actions. Uh, and then specific to the position, really making great decisions, um, making them consistently, and then you know, accuracy uh, of ball placement and the speed at which you can translate decision to ball out of my hand um, is in, important too. So uh, there's a lot that goes into it, a lot. On the left front, Brian. Uh, Tom, go back to defensive line real quick. Um, you know, Puna, Christmas. I feel like he's my bouncer right. sometimes. He just he stands he there. With, can you fold your arms a little bit and look, like look tough? Do you? <laughs> Um, you know, the specific guys, you know, Puna, Christmas, Nelson, all these guys, are they big because that's what the previous regime wanted or you think they're just out of shape or, or and I, I don't know. Okay. I mean, that's the best I can answer. Okay. And then to follow that is, do, do you, do you, do you not see talent there or is there none? Or? I, I don't know that either because again, football is not played going around cones. And in mat drills, football's played in shoulder pads and helmets. And so uh, I see some guys that can run and change direction. Uh, now, how, how good of football players they are, we'll find out in the 12 practices we get with pads on. I'm Tom. He released a statement last week, but is there an update on Reese Lateo and his standing with the, this football program? Yeah, it's Lato. Um, no, the, the, the standing is that, you know, we're, we're not a court of law. You know, we're not um, into that. So I think, you know, we're going to reserve judgment for once we get some resolution 
as to uh, the severity and, if any, of, of any crimes that he might have committed. Uh, again, right now, this, it's allegation at, at this point. Um, but at the same time, I think if, you know, that resolution, you know, and I've had this conversation with him and his parents, that resolution needs to be um, sped up maybe than what a normal court process might be because I got to know something, you know, somewhere around the summer as to whether we're going to allow him to be part of the team or not. Far back, right? Alex? Hey, Coach. Um, just to clarify one thing from earlier, when you talked about the F-backer, were you saying that Bonnie, a guy like Bonnie and Locke would come on the field as nickel, or were you saying that you actually see those body types as F backer types? No, no, no. Yeah, they would be the nickels. Okay. okay. And the F backer would come would come, come would come out of the game. And then my second question was just about on the bound like on the boundary side, you mentioned Nashawn Hughes. How's that? They, they already got like what an F backer is and a, a B back. You guys already know all that. Alex. Um, Alex. Oh. As far as as far as over there, do you not do you, do you see Malcolm Roach bumping inside to the end because you talked about Nashawn Hughes? Uh, Correct. Over. Malcolm will be a defensive end. Okay. Uh, heading into the, I don't know if that's a change or not, but he has been since we've been here. Right up front on the right, John. Coach, what happens to a guy when when you don't see that effort in, in protecting the ball throughout spring? What, what are they on your bad list? How do they get back? Oh yeah, they get. I mean. You see hats flying, whistles flying. I mean, you see a 41-year-old dude with really bad knees running around and chasing people. Hey, but before you write Malcolm Roach as a defensive end, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure right now, Alex. I got, I got to be honest with you. Um, if maybe you can go grab Todd Orlando, because I know there had been some discussion. I saw you typing away over there. Yeah, I know. Um, so I, I don't want to make that statement until I'm sure. So I, I got we got to figure out where he's going. On the right, Chuck. Tom, you mentioned what you want to see in your quarterback. Do you have in your mind a timetable when you want to have that guy decided, whether it's coming out of the spring or before the opener? What can we look forward to? Probably the within a week of training, into a week of training camp, I think it's – yeah, there, there will not be a starting quarterback named in after spring ball. Uh, we'll have an idea, and we'll have and we'll have that conversation with those kids too on you know where they kind of stand. But I think it's important that uh, that they at least have the ability to go win the job in training camp and really win the job over the, the course of the summer uh, in terms of leading their teammates. And so. Uh, like I said, not a whole lot of time for evaluation in, in training camp, but that one will probably go, you know, five to seven days maybe in the training camp. But then I want the guy, whoever we do name as the starter, to know that this is his team too for a couple weeks before heading into the game. Back left, Steve. Coach, uh, who has emerged as really the team leaders on here in the off season? Anybody specifically stand out for you? Uh, P.J. Locke, definitely his first and only set of parents that I've actually called uh, to personally thank them uh, for sending us a marvelous human being. Uh, he's a great leader. I don't know. I don't know if the kid can play football or not, but he's a very vocal leader on the field out there and in, in all of those drills. And then you know we we literally have an academic meeting every single week, once a week usually on Thursdays, where we go over every single kid uh, in front of the whole staff. And for the last three weeks, I mean, it's been glowing reviews for him. And so I picked up the phone, called his mom, called his dad, and said, thank you uh, for raising such a good son. And I think probably the other vocal leader right now that stands out is Nashon. Uh, the kids listen to him. Again, I don't know if he can play football. Uh, but the kids seem to, to gravitate towards him, and uh, he seems to be very comfortable expressing himself in front of the team as well. Far left, Cedric. Coach, your um, upperclassmen have been, been through the ringer here. How receptive have they been of, of the new 
the Tom Herman pre-camp and what, when you look in their eyes, what do you see as far as, you know, moving forward? Yeah, I, I see, you know, I think in our first team meeting, I think I said, raise your hand if you played on a winning football team at the University of Texas, and there were like three hands that went up. Um, so that's a little bit shocking, but at the same time, I think they also know that we, we better try something. And it's probably even less immediate pushback than, than when we got to Houston. You know, when we took over at Houston, they were eight and five, had just beaten Pitt and a miraculous comeback in the Armed Forces Bowl. And so I think there were some kids there that still kind of looked sideways at us when, you know, we told them to do certain things. And, uh, but here I think, you know, our guys are, are embarrassed and they, they understand that uh, change is necessary in order to, to achieve some results. Tom, on, on that note, at, in this program, whether it's football, basketball, whatever sport, over the past several years, there's been a lot of coaches. Is that Mike, Mike Finger? Yeah. Congrats on your promotion, man. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, that's big time. Uh -huh. there, there have been uh, uh, <laughs> several coaches who have talked about the attitude of the players saying, we're Texas. And that has been an issue that Shaka Smart has talked about, that Charlie Strong has talked about, that Mac Brown has talked about, that people in this program expect that because we're Texas, certain things are going to happen. Is that something that you've addressed with them? And have you noticed that so far with some of your players? I haven't felt it as much, again, because I think I think they realized that that was probably a big root of what three straight seven loss seasons were. And so they, they understand that that's really not how you, you got to go about doing things. And so I haven't felt it as much. Uh, the, the, the lore of it <laughs> has lived a little bit, but I, I think just the way we go about our business as a staff, too, there, there's just no room for any of that. Um, it gets stamped out in such a hurry around here that it really has no time to breathe. Um. Tom, when you, when you talk about the defensive line, I know you don't sound happy with that group. Uh, how much of a concern is that just knowing the, and I know you haven't watched film, but the issues this program has had defensively the last couple of years, how much does that add to the concern when you talk about the offenses you've got to stop in this league and just trying to get that front line right before you worry about everything else? Yeah, I mean, every, not, not to, I think your, your question is valid, but I mean, everything is a concern right now. It really is. And we don't, I mean, we could go out and by practice 10, they could be the best position group. I don't know. You know, I mean, I've, I've seen things like that happen. But it, it is a concern knowing the league that we play in. But I also know we've got four defensive coaches that are as good as there are in, in the country uh, that, I mean, I, I was going to say something funny. I'm not going to. Um, I mean, I've I've seen Todd Orlando make chicken salad out of out of some lesser parts. Um, so I, I have a lot of confidence in that staff and and what they're able to do with whatever talent that we've inherited. Tom um, Brecken Hager is a guy who started five games, ended up like second on the team in tackles, led the team in sacks, TFLs. What do you see for him starting out in the spring? What, you know, intrigues you about him? Uh, intensity. You know, the guy, the guy goes really hard, and which is probably not a surprise to any of us who's ever seen his dad play. Um, so I'm excited for Brecken. I, I think this will be a, it's an important spring for everybody, but uh, I think it's important for him to solidify a a major role, whether it's starter or not starter, you know, and, and on defense, you'd like to be able to roll some some guys in and keep them fresh, especially in, in this in this league and, and the up tempo offenses that that have uh, kind of made this what this league is known for. So I love his intensity, though. 
He, he wants so badly to cut his hair too. So hopefully we can. Uh, I don't know if you guys. He, he said he's not cutting it till we win the Big 12 championship. So hopefully we can get his hair cut pretty soon. Can he play? Can he get a look at metal? He'll, he'll actually. I think that's what we've talked about is both getting him a look at that B boundary outside linebacker may not have as much enough mass to do that, but he's he's a, a decent pass rusher from what I understand. Uh, and then, yeah, middle linebacker would be the, the other spot. In terms of uh, Coach Orlando's ability to make pretty delicious chicken salad, what is his uh, what is recipe? His scheme? I don't know. Yeah, well, what is his <laughs> scheme and then uh, his coaching aptitude uh, that kind of allows him to do that year after year? Well, I think what's really important as a as a staff is that you mold and conform your your offense or defense around the players that you inherit, not the other way around. It's not, oh, you know, woe is me. We, we you know, at Ohio State, for example, I, maybe the most proud of a, a year that I've been, not the national championship year, was when we went 12-0 and in our first year there. And we showed up, and uh, the leading receiver, returning receiver, had seven catches. And we wanted to be, philosophically, we wanted to be a balanced offense. Um, but we had a true sophomore quarterback that really didn't know a whole lot about the forward pass. Um, and we had very inexperienced wide receivers. What we did have, we had a big, strong offensive line and a guy by the name of Carlos Hyde and, and Braxton could run. And so I think we finished second in the country in rushing that year, like 315 yards a game. Now, we only threw it for 150 or 120 maybe, but we went 12-0. and 0 because, And then you recruit – to your philosophy. So I think that's probably the thing that Coach Orlando and his staff do the best is they figure out what are your player strengths and let's put them in position to um, exploit those strengths. And then let's go recruit to a certain scheme or body type or whatever you're looking for. But you can't just go palms up and say, well, sh oh, shucks, I, we don't have the kind of players that we will figure it out. These are the players that we do have. In the time that you, worked, you need a microphone, by the way. <laughs> In the time that you've worked with them? We're, on, we're live on Longhorn Network. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Live on Longhorn Network. In the time that you've worked with them, have you seen him have a full like uh, stock full of players for the scheme he wants to run? T.O.? Yeah. Um, not for the whole season. You know, we were pretty banged up that second year at – at Houston, and you know, I think we we had some veteran guys in the secondary that first year. We were a little bit green uh, up front, and then the second year it was kind of the reverse of that. And so, I, I haven't seen him yet with a, with a full stock, but um, that's what signing day is for. Coach, we just saw Coach Shipley out in the hallway walking in here. Uh, talk to me about how important bringing him on the staff is? Oh, um, I tell you what, it's, it's, it's been a home run thus far. It, this is a guy that doesn't want to be a coach again, that is, is happy in his role as director of, of high school relations, takes a tremendous amount of pride in it, wants to be the best in the country. I didn't say he didn't, didn't want to be the best. He, he wants to be the best and extremely well-respected in the high school community and obviously with his two sons, Jordan and Jackson, having played here, uh, the guy's, you know, got burnt orange in his blood and uh, he's very passionate about this place and uh, couldn't be happier with the hire right now. Coach, I just have uh, two, two quick questions for you. Uh, are you more concerned about the defensive line group or the tight end group at, at this moment? Um, and the second one is, what would you say is the strongest group uh, that you have right now? Um, I, I would say I'm more concerned with the defensive line because, again, Tim Beck and the offensive staff can figure out a way to, to not have to play with a tight end, and we can send Corby Meekins on the road recruiting all year. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of teams in the country that can figure that out. You can't, can't play without a, a defensive line. So we, we got to – they've been duly challenged. Um, and then what was the second part of your question? A 
let me reserve that one till we put shoulder pads on. Um, you know, anybody can look good running around cones and jumping over bags and all that. I, I, I don't want to say anything is strong just yet. Tom, these guys don't play in a bowl game. They have a lot of time off in the winter. How out of shape was this group when you guys got started with offseason? And, and kind of how do you feel about where you're at today, conditioning wise? Not awful. Um, so you, you can, again, that that's, it goes back to you know. I think the guys were embarrassed. I think th these guys knew that it, uh, they had to work out or, over the the, the winter. Um, you know, so. And, but there's a lot. I mean, you can lose your in shapeness in about a week. You know, look what twenty years of losing your in shapeness has done to me. But they responded very well, and and they they've recovered pretty well from some really intense lifting sessions. Like our, our we squat on Wednesday, and and I mean, there were guys have made unbelievable strides in the weight room. Some of their guys were. When we tested them, their one rep max on squat is now what they're doing for a set of three or more. Some some guys are even you know if if my one rep max was 475, you know just the other day they did a set of three at 495, um, where six weeks ago they couldn't they could barely lift 475 one time. And so I think they've recovered and their bodies are adapting pretty well. But I, I wouldn't say they were awfully out of shape. When we first got here, on the right, Chuck. Tom, after the 15 practices are over, what do you want to know about <coughs> these guys, and what do you want them to know about you when it, when spring is over? I, I want them to know what champions practice like. I want that to be um, fully ingrained. You know, there's a famous quote by Michael Jordan. Uh, you know, when he talked about how he made practice so intense and so difficult that the games were easy. In a two-sentence quote, uh, he used the word practice, I think it was seven times in, in the two-sentence quote. And I think that's our guys need to understand that, that games are not won and lost on Saturdays or Fridays if you're playing Texas Tech or Thursday if you're playing Iowa State. They're, they're, they're won and lost now and in training and in preparation. And what do I want them to know about me is that we don't miss. We, we don't ever that, – that winning championships is exhausting. And, you know, towing the line is exhausting. But we as a staff are going to make sure that, um, you know, if a drill says full speed through the cone, that it doesn't matter if it's – the 800th, 100th rep of that, or if it's hot, or if you're tired, or if you're sore, that if we say full speed through the cone, and you don't go through the full speed through the cone, then there's going to be consequences for that. And uh, again, that's exhausting. Uh, you know, you feel like uh, the the police out there at times uh, as a coach, but you have to set the expectation level early um, when developing a culture and developing a program. And I would, I would hope that after 15 practices, they know what that expectation is. On the left, Kirk. Yeah, Tom, speaking of that, you've been around winning programs your last two stops in a big, big way. You know, from the, what you've seen so far, do you see this team having the makeup of that kind of winning team? I don't, I don't know. Uh, be, uh, again, there, there's so much that you can't glean from running around cones and shorts. This, this game is, if they ever take the shoulder pads and helmets off of us on Saturdays, and it would be a whole, whole different game, and I'll probably go sell widgets somewhere. But it, it's a game that's played with shoulder pads and helmets for a reason. And I'll be able to answer that question probably a lot better after the spring game than I, than I could right now. Back right, Craig. Tom, a lot of uh, questions and conversation about numbers. You mentioned the, the numbers at Ohio State when, when you had the weapons that you did. Do you and the offensive staff, in looking at what you have right now, even before getting onto the field with spring drills, discuss the kinds of balance or the kinds of numbers you'd like in terms of 
whatever, 250 running, 250 passing, this, that. Does that go into the conversation, or do you not even have a feel for that until no. you see what's going on? Yeah, we, we, we don't um, because I think that's part of the evaluation process is, okay, who are we going to be? What are we good at? And what are our strong suits? Um, you know, if it's running backs, do we play two running backs at the same time maybe and don't play with a tight end? Or, or you know, we, so there, there's, there's got to be a lot of evaluation going on uh, in spring practice, and but I do think, and again, I'm 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 going in the wayback machine twice now. With one quote from Coach Brown, and another from my mentor, Greg Davis, in that you know balance doesn't mean 250 and 250. I think balance is winning the game the way the defense dictates you having to win the game. Because uh, the defense can always line up with more people than you can block in the run game. And they can line up with more people than you can throw against in the pass game. And so if they're going to line up to stop the run, can you beat them throwing the pass? If they're going to line up to stop the pass, can you beat them running the football? And so I think that's what balance means to me, is the ability to, to have enough strength to you that, or maybe it's like Ohio State, maybe it's we can't pass the football. <laughs> Uh, that first year, but we're going to find creative ways to run the football so that we can, um, you know, equate the numbers, so to speak. And so I, I think that's what we look at the most is, A, what are our strengths? Uh, what are we good at? And then what's our identity based off those strengths? And then being able to hopefully win a game running or throwing the football. Front left, Brian. Uh, a Moncrief question. Uh, is there any updates on when you know we might see some construction dust start to accumulate here? I've been and asking Fernando that for a while. Right. Uh, that's um, probably a fun question. But that, that's number one. Update on update on Moncrief updates. And number two is uh, how are things coming along with just kind of staff hires? I mean, are you do you have your eye on some more uh, n what would be new positions here to bring some other people in that yeah the you're working on the Moncrief. I mean, I know they're meeting once if not more a week. I, I think the the locker room obviously is the biggest part of that piece with the locker room, the graphics and wall design, um, the weight room and the training room. So, but part of the locker room is actually building 120 lockers. And so we're not going to just start ripping lockers out if we don't have lockers to replace them. Um, so I think that'll start happening in a few weeks, to be honest with you. And the, the wall graphics, certainly within the next few weeks. And then the, the weight room, I think, and training room will probably be a summertime project. Do you have a number yet? A total renovation number yet? No. I, I'll, I'll get you one at some point when we're done. Uh, and then staff hires. I think we only have one open job left, and that, that is a new one that's uh, a program assistant in uh, recruiting. Uh, so we're, we're actively you know, trying to, to fill that spot. But other than that, everything should be, you know, with the hiring of Bob, uh, other than that last position in recruiting, everything is kind of correct. Yeah. Tom, are you and um, Tim pretty comfortable with Matthew and, um, and maybe maybe Josh Covey as that third quarterback? Or is Gerard still in play there? I don't know. I, I think you know Matthew and Covey will be the, the first two that get the looks. I don't. Um, I mean, with Covey being a guy that's actually somewhat impressive, running around the cones, he's a, he's an athletic dude, um, which is kind of what you want from your third quarterback. Is uh, you know. He's your third quarterback for a reason, so um, maybe he he can add a dimension or get you out of a game running around a little bit back there, which hopefully he can provide. But I, I don't think Gerard, to, to, to do what we're talking about doing with him, like we did with De'Eric King at Houston, I mean, you're talking about an eight to ten play package to just get you out of a game. And so... We don't want to fill his bucket up with that in the spring and take reps away from Matthew and Covey to, to show us what they've got. Uh, but if, if Merrick and Covey 
can't be that third guy, then in training camp we'll, we'll start introducing a few things for Gerard. But we want him to be able to focus on being the best wide receiver he can be and um, worry about the third-team quarterback stuff when we, when we need to. All right, middle Rogers. Tom, you sent out a tweet last week that kind of mushroomed with your guest speaker at the high school clinic. Is there a backstory to you getting Bill Belichick here, and what does it mean to have him come? Oh out? yeah, it's um, no real backstory other than track the cell phone number down, and I had spoken to him a couple times when on the phone, I believe, when they were drafting a Landon Roberts, uh, and. So just kind of introduced my, myself to him and over the phone, and we started talking about Elandon because of what a special player he is in terms of his work ethic. I mean, you're talking about a seventh-round pick uh, that had been a one-year starter in college that works his way into the starting middle linebacker job at the New England Patriots as a rookie. Um, and you don't do that just on talent alone. And so we talked about E-Rob for a long time and I just kind of, hey coach, by the way, uh, we got a clinic on April 7th, would it be free and where would you be free? And I could tell he was probably looking on his phone or something and I don't even know where he was. I think I woke him up like at 10 in the morning or something like that, but um, he can do whatever he wants. He's five-time Super Bowl champ as far as I'm concerned, but uh, he looked at his calendar. He said, it looks, it looks open right now. Let me check with my assistant or whatever, and within a couple of days we had, we had confirmed it and excited as all get out. That, that's, a, that's a big one. Time for two last ones. Chip on the right. Go Tom, the um, why, do we, why do we only have time for two more? Because yeah. Longhorn Network you got, is... You got something coming up. No, I don't. <laughs> we're good. <laughs> yeah, we're good. We got to one. Um, field safety, I know... Friggin' this guy over here trying to run the show. <laughs> time, time for two more. I'll tell you when there's time for two more. <laughs> Craig Niver. Yeah, I'm just messing with you. It's playful, man. Craig, Craig Niver was talking about the field safety position, how important it is, who would start out there uh, in the spring, and as far as the pushback that you experienced, was it more or less than what you thought it would be here, and was it from any certain group? Uh, I don't know the field safety. I think we'll, we'll see who Coach Niver jogs out there, who he, he thinks, and, and Coach Orlando thinks. Uh, but again, they, just because they jog out with the first team tomorrow doesn't mean anything, in my opinion. Um, and, and there was less, Chip, to be honest, less pushback than I thought uh, because of, you know, what we had to to go through at, at Houston, and um, these guys have been. Good. I'm I'm not I'm not ready to anoint anybody yet, but uh, it's it has been one of the pleasant surprises of the first three three four months here has been the the amount of buy-in that, that we've gotten um, so far. <laughs> I knew that was coming. I knew it was coming. Here, you want the mic? Uh, co uh, Coach, uh, Chris Warren uh, got more skins on the wall than any of your other running backs. Would it be, would it be presumptive to say he's leading that, and, and what do the other guys bring to the table? Uh, again, I don't – you guys keep trying to bait me into saying who's a starter and who's not before – we jog out, but uh, Chris has been impressive. Uh, he has been in, in uh, the off-season drills. I told him, in fact, and I don't mind sharing with you, I kind of pulled him aside during uh, one of the workouts and I said, I said, you have been a, a very pleasant surprise and you're going to make a lot of money someday playing this position if you put your pads down and run through somebody. And so I think that is our challenge to him is to prove that toughness and durability this spring. Uh, but I do, I, I think, I've, I've never seen a 255 pound kid move and bend the way that, that he moves and bends. Um, it's, it's 
pretty cool thing to watch. Uh, but again, football's not played running around cones. Sean? Coach, uh, the wide receiver position seems like you have a lot of numbers there. Are you satisfied with what you see there and you think you might have a possibility to, to have a great four or five wide receiver set if you need it? It's the, it's the first time really ever, not just as a head coach, maybe ever that uh, the majority, we, we went through our champions, you know, great in, in the classroom, in the weight room, uh, everything you do are you worthy enough of being called a champion, which means you get to eat really cool stuff tonight. And, uh, and we break the, the year up into quarters. So the winter conditioning was one quarter. Then you've got an opportunity to earn that again in spring practice. And we'll have one at the end of the semester. Then there's summer conditioning. And then there's the season. And so each opportunity is, a, is an oppor- each one of those quarters is an opportunity for a, a kid to kind of, you know, grade a champion. And, and we, we probably shouldn't have very many in March, and we don't, uh, but I'm not panicked. Uh, if we have this few in July, I'll, I'll be really panicked uh, because, again, you can – if even if it's not your fault, you know, the, like a, the kid like Andrew Beck, great kid, you didn't participate in the winter offseason, you can't be a champion. You know, so any little one miss here, one miss there, you're done. You don't – you can't do it. Um, I said that leading to your question about the wide receivers, and it's the first time I've ever seen a wide receiver group have over 50% of their position group as champions in the first quarter uh, of, a, of a season. So that's, that's telling. That means they're, they're buying in. Uh, how good of football players they are, I don't know, but I like the fact that there is some experience in that room, and and it seems to be some some decent kids too that are willing to work hard. Stand left, uh, coach. What are what do you think are the biggest obstacles to sort of coming in and establishing your own culture? Like you said, a lot of kids have been here uh, through a past regime. So how is that? You know, what's that process like? Oh, it's I I, I don't have any other word except exhausting. Um, it is every second of every day, never letting up. <laughs> uh, I got hit with the stomach flu last week. It's kind of a funny story. And, I mean, fever, chills, sweats. And it was, I think I've missed now three practices or workouts. I missed one when I had pneumonia. missed one practice at Sam Houston State. I missed a practice at Ohio State when my son Maverick was born, and then I missed Tuesday morning's workout. And I'm actually rooming with Coach McKnight. And I just said, "Man, I can't. I'm. I got stuff coming out of my body that I'm. Don't want to be any more graphic than that." Um, I said, but it was like 4:30 in the morning. I said, "You, you tell the guys. So you make sure that they know I'm not out playing golf with some booster or something like that." That. Um, that it takes something like this to, to keep me from a workout. And I, I tell you that story because it is absolutely exhausting uh, to change a culture and to keep your, your thumb on the human nature side of it. Because, again, as we've, as we've talked before, human nature, we all gravitate to what's easy and what's convenient and what's pain-free, and uh, we all do. And... and especially 18 to 22 year old guys and but we're asking them to do things that are self-sacrificing and painful and inconvenient and um and really really hard and so in order to do that you just you can't miss and you can't miss an opportunity to correct a mistake uh, or else those mistakes they grow and you know, we've, we've got a saying, you know, everybody, well, Coach, you're making a mountain out of a molehill. I, I know. I know I am. Because if I don't or we don't as a staff, then we're going to look up one day and we're going to have a whole bunch of molehills. And we're going to have a program full of molehills. And uh, you've you got to stamp them out as soon as you see them. And you, you've got to change young men's way of thinking. And that's exhausting. But the rewards are unbelievable. Frank Middle Rodgers. Tom, when you say you're not sure if guys can, can play, is that because you want to see them with your own eyes and 
your own staff teaching them before you make a determination yeah, I, rather I, than what they've done on tape? I have not watched a single snap of film. Uh, I can say that with all honesty. I, I mean, I, I remember probably three times maybe that our games at Houston were on different times than the games at, at Texas, and so I've, I've caught them on TV a few times, but not, not enough. So I, I really have no opinion other than what they've shown me this, this six weeks uh, of winter off season. And none of that has anything, I mean, it has a lot to do with playing football, but none of it is, uh, you can't equate any of it with the ability to play football, if that makes any sense. So just because they ran around cones real good and they jump real good or run real fast, doesn't mean they're gonna be a really good football player. And we'll find that out when we put pads on Tuesday after, after spring break. Tom, in terms of putting your offense in, this group has had, you know, even a guy who's been here for six years has been through six different coordinators, six different systems in those six years. Is that especially? Is that true? Yeah, going back wow. to Harson, then Major, the final two years of Mac, then a, a new guy in scheme each year of Charlie. So from that standpoint, is that, you know, a, a special kind of challenge in putting your system in? I think it's actually can work to our advantage. Because these guys know there's no, or at least shouldn't be, a whole lot of automatic retention of, of anything because it's been so new every year that, you know, if we call this a table and in that language they called it a platform, I mean, the, the fact that he can translate that into table automatically should be a little bit easier. And so uh, I would think it would be to our advantage that, that these kids have gone through so much change and uh, they don't have any, you know, major memorization issues uh, because you're, you're really unlearning an offense that you've only known for whatever, you know, 12 months. I got five more minutes. <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> uh, Tom, I, Coach Werheim was in here a couple of weeks ago talking about some of the challenges he had that first season at U of H just with all the different line combinations. And 11 just, different starting lineups in and, 13, 14 games. And just try, what, what were you most proud of in terms of the job he did that first year and how have you seen him just in terms of his interactions with that group and trying to, trying to get that group together? Well, I mean, you want to talk about chicken salad. I mean, that was the ultimate, uh, you know, patchwork, piecemeal, whatever phrase you want to use to go 13-1 and one, uh, with starting a true freshman at center for most of the year and not knowing from week to week who was going to line up next to him. Uh, that was impressive. Uh, and we need to see, and, and he really kind of dealt the same situation a little bit this past year where then you also had really, because of all the switching around, really one returning starter, and that was the, the center, Will Noble. You know, the, the two guards and both tackles were, were new uh, this past year. So he's done a great job developing those guys. That is, that is a, a unit that is so unique. Uh, you know, football, in my opinion, is the most interdependent sport ever created, uh, meaning I can't do my job unless you do your job well. Um, and then you dive into it even more. Offensive line is, is arguably the, the most interdependent position group uh, in that game. And those guys, they eat, sleep, breathe offensive line. Uh, and it has to be that way um, because you literally can't do your job well if the guy next to you isn't doing his job well. And they, they form a unique bond. Often, the great offensive lines that I've been around have been inseparable. Um, and we've, we've got to create that here. Front left, Brian. You know, Tom, uh, Shaka mentioned earlier this year that his guys, they, they felt the weight of playing in Texas and trying to play up to the name and the fans and all that stuff. And when you say that your guys, you feel like they've been embarrassed, I was hoping you could just explore that and explain that a little more because how how can you really tell without them 
you know, they're not going to come crying to you. But right. How can you tell that they've been embarrassed and they know that what they've put out there is unacceptable? I don't know. It's a theory. <laughs> um, but it's one from 20 years of coaching and, and seeing different teams and how they respond uh, to new cultures and to have this little amount of, of pushback tells me something. I, I mean, I got to read something into that. And that is, I, I would imagine, uh, my theory is that, that they've been embarrassed. None of them have physically told me that or anything like that. I just, I get that sense that um, in just daily in interactions and casual conversations that that is somewhat the case. Uh, and yeah, I don't, we all came to Texas for a reason. We, we, we knew what we signed up for, uh, players and coaches. And so to feel any kind of weight is, is good. I mean, it's, as Coach Brown said, Tom, it can be the greatest job in the world because there's tens of millions of fans that care about, very passionately about what you do every single day. And Tom, it can be one of the hardest jobs in the world because there's tens of millions of fans that care very passionately about what you do every day. And I think our players know that too. And, um, but there's no, I don't know, to use that as, a, as an excuse for any kind of level of play, I mean, that's a whole separate department. <laughs> you know, that, that doesn't, it should never affect how you play or how you prepare. Coach, I know you mentioned Nashon. I want to ask you about Malik uh, Jefferson. What have you seen out of him uh, as far as the offseason goes, and, and do you need to see more going forward? Uh, I've seen a guy that's gravitated towards his position coach and really taken his position coach's words to heart and, and tried to, to do the things that Coach Orlando is telling him to, and that's you know, he's got to be a little bit more vocal. I mean, he is very well respected for everything that that he does representing our program to, I mean, he was just at, what, a leadership conference or something in, in Indianapolis, right, for the NCAA. Uh, I mean, the kids, he's a phenomenal kid. Uh, but, you know, we asked him, you know, great leaders aren't always liked by everybody and stop don't worry about being liked worry about being a great leader and being vocal and being demanding on your teammates and he's done a really good job growing into that and hopefully we continue continue to see more of it uh, throughout the spring possibly the last one Kurt. <laughs> already uh craig niver and you've been together for a long time is there anything long time that separates him and what do you rely on him for um, yes, the, the thing that separates him is his energy level. I mean, it's off the charts, off the charts enthusiasm. Um, he, so much so that he had a heart problem. He actually has one of those little pacemakers like sitting up here. So if he if his heart screws up again, it'll shock it back into into working again. Um, but his energy level is off the charts and. What do I rely? I don't. Um, he's a my pulse of the staff guy. You know, you know how how is the staff? Are we are we where we need to be? Do you need more time to work on football? Do you need more time recruiting? Do you need more? You know, do you need this? Do you need that? Uh, and then he's an idea guy. He's I, we use about one out of every ten of his ideas, but uh, it's good that he feels confident in throwing things out for the betterment of our program and, uh, you know, great. Some of, the, some of the, his ideas have been phenomenal, phenomenal that we've used. 